Identifying and reporting possible child abuse and neglect is an important responsibility of community members. Because of this, each state, including Colorado, has developed laws that state there are certain members of society who are required to report suspected child abuse and neglect. Mesa County Child Protective Services has developed these training modules to assist these mandated reporters in completing this legal obligation. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for part two of this four-part series on the identification and reporting of child abuse and neglect. In this segment, we will discuss different types of child neglect and how Colorado law defines neglect and some ways to help identify if a child is currently being neglected. Colorado laws pertaining to child abuse and neglect can be found in Title 19 of the Colorado Revised Statutes, which is commonly referred to as the Colorado Children's Code. The Children's Code states that child neglect is an act or omission in one of the following categories that threatens the health or welfare of a child. This includes any case in which a child is in need of services because the child's parents, legal guardian, or custodian fails to take the same actions to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, medical care, or supervision that a prudent parent would take. Neglect is often categorized by child protection into the following types. Deprivation of necessities, injurious environments, including exposure to illegal activities and violence, educational neglect, medical neglect, failure to protect, and lack of supervision. As you can see, there are many situations that can be neglectful for children. Today we will talk with several professionals about neglect, how to recognize it, and why it's important to report it. Um, deprivation of necessities encompasses several areas with children. Um, from a lack of adequate housing uh, to be a lack of food or medical dental care. Children who come from uh, an environment that is, doesn't meet their needs or has deprivations for their basic care, um, those children often are very dirty children. They have no personal hygiene. They aren't bathed um, or showered on a regular basis. They smell. Um, they can smell like the environment. Um, they can smell like uh, body odor, they can just be that type of um, smell that just doesn't sound, or just doesn't s smell like children who come from clean environments do. Uh, they can smell like urine because um, oftentimes there's other indicators um, like bedwetting, bedwetting that goes with that. Um, head lice, uh, children who don't have their um, basic care needs met often have lice on a chronic basis and it doesn't go away because the parent doesn't spend the time to take care of it. Um, they can have other indicators where their hair is a mess, um, they wear their pajamas to school, they have two left shoes on or inappropriately um, sized shoes. Uh, there's a lot of things that go with that. Not coming with coats when the weather's too cold, wearing shorts uh, when it's too cold outside. Um, these are all kids who are probably taking care of themselves as much as a parent is. Um, other indicators is hoarding. Uh, hoarding of food uh, can be an indi indication where children are not um, being fed appropriately and, and their basic needs aren't there. Basic needs include heat, water, shelter, food, um, and safety. Uh, those are the basic things that a child needs and without that you're going to know it. Um, those kids We'll tell you about it and we'll show it in other ways. Um, injurious environments are those environments where safety uh, is a high priority for children. Um, safety can be things where the environment is too dirty and pot potentially it's a health risk. Uh, dirty houses can be homes where they haven't uh, taken care of the dishes for several days, um, where there's old food out and molding, that there are uh, numerous pets in the home and rather than the pets going outside, the pets use the floor. And so there's feces, um, urine, uh, kitty litter or cat boxes that aren't cleaned up, um, lots of clothing, trash that's not removed from the home. Um, other parts of an injurious environment can be that there are medications accessible to children 
that should be uh, put up high or put away in a locked box. Um, that there are uh, substance abuse related issues, uh, DUI, um, where a parent has been arrested for driving under the influence or that there's a chronic alcohol use. Um, along with that, um, other indicators of dirty houses are that children talk about uh, they have no place to sleep, um, that there's too much stuff on the bed, uh, or that um, they are, are not able to go to sleep because of the number of people in the house, that those are things that um, can make an injurious uh, environment. Um, what does that look like for children? Children will have behaviors that come from those environments. Um, not to say that they are solely for an injurious environment, but children that have uh, things that occur in environments can be um, chronic uh, hyper attentiveness uh, or where they are more um, hyper vigilant. Uh, they need to know that everything's okay, that things go well for them. Um, they have talked about that. Uh, they will give you information like they um, can't go to a certain place in the home or they can't get to a certain place in the home or they'll talk about having dog feces or animal feces on the floor or it's dirty. Um, that they have no clean dishes, no clean clothes. Um, that dad got arrested um, or dad drinks a lot um, and exactly what they do drink. Um, children in those environments can give you sometimes clearly how much they drink and exactly what it is they drink, whether it's liquor or beer. Um, and that's information that they have because they see it on a regular basis. Domestic violence is um, a pattern of behaviors that one partner uses to control and manipulate another person. It comes in many different types. There's physical abuse, which is actually punching, shoving, hitting, beating. It could be verbal, where you're um, calling someone a very unattractive name, derogatory name. Yeah. Emotional may be, um, is another type of abuse, where you, um, you feel less than about yourself. You don't feel confident. You don't feel um, that you can make decisions, that you're a good parent, those kinds of things. Um, it may, there's a whole gamut of different ones. It could be financial abuse where every, every cent that you make you have to have accountable and it's spent to take care of family responsibilities and it's not yours. Um, and it keeps you from moving forward and leaving the lack of money or that all of it's given towards bills. Um, there's uh, sexual abuse where a partner is made to act, do sexual acts that they're um, not comfortable with or it's withholding. Uh, physical connection, physical touch, and, and um, intimacy. Um, those are to list just a few of the different kinds of abuse that there are. Victims of domestic violence um, can be a lot of different people. It's whoever is in the family. Most commonly we like to identify females um, as the victims of domestic violence. But one of the things that we've learned is that if there are children in the house, all children are victims of the domestic violence. Whether they've seen it or they've heard it, or they've directly or indirectly experienced it. But research has shown that if there is a case of um, uh, uh, okay, if there's a case of confirmed child abuse happening in the family, then 30 to 60 percent of the time there is there is domestic violence in the house. If there is domestic violence in the house, then 30 to 60 percent of the time there is child abuse in the house. So what we're finding is they don't happen isolatory; they happen together. Well, we have some t statistics of, yes, domestic violence, child abuse happens in Mesa County. It's a, a topic that we don't like to talk about a lot, but yes, we, it, it happens, and Latimer House um, serves children of domestic violence. Um, in our safe house, we serve approximately 60 children in the last six months, and in our non-residential settings, um, that means community clients coming in and families coming in that if a mom comes in or a dad comes in we offer services for kids and right now in the last six months we've served five kids in that setting. Um, in transitional housing and that's when people leave the shelter and go out into the community we have transitional places they can live if they can't go into their own housing right away and that's approximately 18 kids we've serviced in the last um, six months. 
that's a fraction of the kids that are impacted here in Mesa County. Um, we'd like to serve more. Um, but getting the information out and letting it be known that if domestic violence is happening in the house, your kids are being impacted and it's okay to ask for help and get those kids help. It impacts kids on a lot of different levels. Um, what we'll see is we'll see the physical reaction, the, the behavioral reaction in schools and in social settings. But it really impacts their ability to have um, a sense of stable and secure relationships with either people in the schools they're working with, with friends, with families or just even with people they bump into in the community. Um, some of the impacts, there can be short-term impacts and there can be long-term impacts. Short-term impacts may mean um, that there may be immediate interventions if there's confirmed child abuse in, in these volatile households where the kids are actually pulled, could be pulled out of the household by Child Protective Services um, or that there are interventions at the schools with quick behavior. But the long-term, um, impacts happens to it impacts their ability to be stable enough and open enough to information so it impacts their ability to learn um, they can't concentrate they can't focus they don't process new information because if you're always worried about what's going to happen at home when I get home you know learning you know mathematics or reading doesn't that um, is doesn't take it isn't as important as going am I going to be able to be home and be safe well, it impacts, um, because it impacts the kids, and kids are so, I believe, to be so transparent with their behaviors, that it's going to impact their ability to be okay in school. If there's going to have, some of the things that you will see in school is kids are going to be truant. If there are things happening in the household, mom's been abused or dad's been abused, or they have intervened and they're the ones that ends up with the abuse because they've tried to separate mom and dad, they miss, may miss school to hide the family secret, to hide the bruises, to hide the extra concern. They're, so they're going to, truancy is going to be an issue. They're going to have low school performance. Um, and when you have low school performance, you're easily frustrated. Then when you get frustrated, you're going to then act out on somebody because kids don't hold that in. They're going to act out on somebody. So you're going to see increased possible referrals to the principal's office, to the um, social, or to the counselor's office because the kids are having a hard time focusing, they're frustrated, they don't know what to do with all of this information, so they could become very aggressive, or they could go the other way and become very introverted and become wallflower, and again, they're gonna skip school. They're not gonna, um, they're not gonna interact with other kids. You will, some of the other behaviors, you may see physical behaviors, which we call traumatic stress reactions. They may experience flashbacks or nightmares, which means they're not sleeping well at home. Um, they may, a flashback may be something that happens during the day that would easily set them off. So if, a, if somebody else said something in the wrong tone of voice or had a physical movement, it might cause them to be, have, um, to react much more quickly and much more aggressively. Um, you'll see them maybe be constant worry, startle, intensified startle, rea startle reactions. You'll see other things will be that you will see will be in intense worry. They're always worried about um, who's at home, what's happening at home, um, uh, worried about safety issues. They'll have a real sensitive startle reaction where little things will set them off real quick and they'll have a much more dramatic reaction than somebody that doesn't come from a volatile household. They're going to have more emotional problems. They're not going to be able to regulate their feelings. They're going to have impulse control problems that they're going to be acting more impulsively. Um, they are going to get, have problems having healthy relationships. They're going to um, many times do overgeneralized stereotypes of dad's the one that's in control, dad's the one that makes decisions, dad's the one that tells mom what to do, and mom's role is to be the one to be compliant, to, um, you know, to, do, to do exactly as they're told, to be more of like that puppet piece and, and to follow through with what, the, uh, what dad tells them to do. So they'll take that into their own relationships of knowing that one person needs to be dominant and the other person needs to be compliant. And dep depending on which role the t kid sides with will depend on what, how they'll behave in the relationship. So it sets them up for being in, recreating more volatile relationships. They don't know how to engage in healthy relationships.
Hello, my name is Frederick Bolton and I'm the Director of Attendance and Transitions for Mesa County School District 51. Uh, I'm here today to talk with you about uh, educational neglect, which is something that I deal with in my position. As the Director of Attendance, I'm involved in setting all of the attendance policy for the school district and I'm also involved in doing follow-up investigations for severe truancy and that can also include homeschool investigations in the event that we feel that a student is being homeschooled and that the homeschooling is actually not taking place. Uh, what I'd like to do to start with is uh, dispel some myths. I get a lot of phone calls every year where people will uh, indicate to me that a child is being homeschooled and they don't feel that uh, these people should be homeschooling their children. Uh, in the last eight years, all the investigations that I've done I can tell you that 95% of the people who are homeschooling their children are doing a good job. Uh, it's a lot like any other uh, industry or any other uh, pursuit. There's always a, a small minority of people that can cast a, a big shadow of dispersion on the people that are doing the right thing. So we need to be careful when we start looking at that as a primary source for educational neglect. Um, when we look at educational neglect, one of the first things that we have to look at is what does uh, compulsory education under the law require for a student to be in a qualified education program. Uh, that can take many forms. It can be a public school education, it can be private, parochial, or as we started with, it can be homeschooling. Uh, the requirements are that a student has to uh, meet a minimum number of hours by statute, uh, and study the course subject areas. Uh, and then uh, prescribed curriculums are not required. A parent can develop their own curriculum. They can choose to go with a store-bought curriculum that they go with locally. They can participate in one of the online charter schools uh, that are available within the state and they can also do uh, online schools that come from outside the state of Colorado. Uh, so uh, again when we're looking at these uh, we have to look for specific content. Uh, another complaint that I will receive in my office is this child is out playing uh, when he should be in school or when she should be in school and therefore this is educational neglect. Uh, if we understand that uh, kids who are being homeschooled or who may be doing an online school uh, aren't necessarily going to be doing that during the same time period that other students are in school uh, it's very reasonable for that child to be out during that time of day. Uh, it's possible that that child does their schooling when the parent has more time in the evenings or maybe the parent works with them in the early part of the mornings. So dispelling some of the myths and some of the things that I get called about, let's talk about what educational neglect really looks like. Uh, when I get phone calls on educational neglect and I go out and do investigations, what I will find uh, more often than not is a family that's isolated. Uh, the kids aren't outside playing all the time. Uh, the kids are very seldom outside the scope of the parent. Uh, if the parent leaves the house, the kid leaves the house with the parent. Uh, as the kids get older, sometimes we'll find these uh, teenage youth that are running around the community at all hours of the day, uh, not just during school hours, but uh, they're out constantly uh, with no parental supervision. But more often than not, what we'll find is an isolated family where the kids have few social contacts, uh, there's no registration for homeschooling, there's no evidence of an online education taking place, and there's very little information about what is going on in this household. Uh, when those calls come in, I may get those from a local agency, such as a police department. I'll get them from uh, the housing authority sometimes. Mesa County Department of Human Services will call me frequently uh, with these types of uh, uh, cases, or it may come from within our own school district. Uh, each one of these cases is investigated thoroughly, and because something doesn't change doesn't mean that it wasn't investigated or that there was uh, uh, evidence of uh, educational neglect. If I go to a home and find out that educational neglect does exist, then uh, I will recommend to the family that they need to get their kids back into a private or a public school, private school, parochial school, online school. The school has to meet the state minimum requirements, whether it's public, private, parochial, or an online school. Uh, if the parent refuses and I have enough evidence to support educational neglect, 
then I can get a court summons, take the, those parents to court, and the court can order the family to go back to school. Uh, in that context, it is possible then to order specifically that they go back to public school. But there's always an option for a family to choose uh, whatever is an approved uh, educational program for their children. So when we look at educational neglect, we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we're not being judgmental, but we do need to report it if we suspect it. It is handled with strict confidentiality. Um, sources are never disclosed. and um, Everything that we do is uh, falls underneath the statute as far as whether or not a determination is made. So I hope you're a little bit more comfortable with this topic. Uh, if you have questions, ask. Uh, and if you have concerns about a child's education, always report it. Uh, it's better to report than not report. And uh, people in my position and people with other community agencies will do the right thing and uh, determine whether or not educational neglect actually exists. Failure to protect is under the neglect category, it's something we come across um, when we're investigating children that are kept in an environment knowingly by an adult who is aware that that's an unsafe environment, yet they don't make the decisions or sometimes they can't um, find the resources to get them or the children out of that, so we become involved at that time. Some of the most common that we see in child protection are in domestic violence. Um, it's been ongoing in a home. There's been either multiple charges or multiple conflicts. And we're out in the home because children are exposed to that. It has emotional effects on them. They can also be victims of the physical abuse going on, which at times can harm them. Our role is going out and seeing if we can help the mother or the father um, in that situation leave it, remove the kids from that situation. We also see it a lot um, with sex offenders. Um, they pick out women with children or they move into homes of women with children and the women don't leave the situation or they feel they're in a relationship and this is the best place for them and these children are left in the care of these offenders and they become a parent or secondary provider and the mother gets more comfortable and leaves them. First thing we do when we go out is assess the situation, try and figure out why that environment's been created and if it's domestic violence, is there services we can get for the mother or the father? Is there um, housing issues? Is there something keeping that parent in that environment? Um, we try to educate the parent. Um, if the parent isn't aware that there's a sex offender in the home, that's public record, we educate them on that. If they're choosing to stay in that environment, is there ways we can put safety in place without stepping in and removing the children or involving the court? Um, lack of supervision is a pretty complex issue. A lot of people call us with questions on that. Um, the main one being, is there an age in Colorado? And there's not a nice defined age. What we look at is the skill level of the child, the environment the child's in, do they have access to adults either through phone numbers, through the knowledge of 911, or through neighbors and kind of the duration and the time of day that this is happening. Is this an everyday thing? Is this a one-time thing? Or is this child left in the care of much younger siblings without the skills to care for those siblings? Um, the primary type of lack of supervision that most people see and associate is the children out in the street or children that have left the home and are out in um, unsafe places or the kid who's left home a lot while parents are working. A lot of our kids aren't seen, they're in the home and a parent is either sleeping or they're under the influence of a substance that has removed them from caring for the child. These are kids that can get into things in the home, um, kids that can be harmed, who don't have the skills to cook for themselves, to feed themselves, yet they're doing that because the parent is not available in some fashion or manner. So we do come across that quite often as well. Neglect is a complex issue that must be looked at on an individual basis. It can be complicated by poverty, addictions, and domestic violence. Let's review some key points from today's segment. Parents are required to provide food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and supervision that a prudent parent would. Differences in parenting styles and values do not, in and of themselves, constitute neglect. There is no legal age in Colorado that a child can be left home alone. Supervision should be determined on a child's individual abilities and needs. Situations such as drug use in the home or domestic violence can create an injurious environment for a child. If after viewing this training you have any questions or would like more information on this topic, please contact the Mesa County Child Protection Community Liaisons at 970-248-2819 or 970-256-2476. If you need to make a report of suspected child abuse or neglect, 
please call the 24-hour Child Protection Hotline at 970-242-1211.